Howdy and welcome to Wise About Texas, your award-winning Texas history podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. Thanks so much for joining me for a little bit of Texas history. This episode is being recorded and released in the summer of 2022, and we are all experiencing that very charming Texas heat. Uh, The other thing that we've got going on, though, is drought. So I want everybody listening to this episode to throw up a prayer for some good rain, especially for our farmers and ranchers who are such a huge part of the Texas economy and a huge part of our culture here at the Wise About Texas podcast. We love our agricultural community, so hang in there. I'm praying for rain, too. I wanted to mention uh, that the Wise About Texas YouTube channel is up. Um, I was uh, behind the times, as I normally am on most things, with respect to YouTube and was informed by a uh, a well-known podcaster friend of mine, actually, from based in California, uh, that you need to get a YouTube channel up and just put your podcast episodes up on it. So I don't think about listening to podcasts through YouTube, but uh, so far, tens of thousands of people do, apparently. So, uh, and, and that might increase the reach of the Texas history uh, programming, which is, of course, the reason we're doing this. So um, check out Wise About Texas on YouTube. I'm also going to put up there some videos. I have, When I drive around, I, I have uh, bribed my kids into filming me at various historic sites. Only for the, the videos are only, you know, 45 seconds to a minute and a half or so, just a little flash of um, a historical site or two or a historical marker or a little story. So I'm going to put those up there and uh, we'll come up with some other things. I know there's a extended video I'm going to post pretty soon uh, where I got to interview some of the legends of uh, Black Rodeo and I interviewed some black cowboys at the Houston Public Library in a public event. It was really special and uh, going to put up there that up there. So I'll try to be a little more conscious of video content and get that up on the YouTube channel. Um, All right, today we are going to take to the skies. Now, I hope everybody listening to this has taken some time to visit the Big Bend region of Texas. It is a very special place, really, in the entire United States and a very unique aspect of the Texas landscape. Now, it's rugged, but it's also very, very beautiful. Um, It's also very, very remote. And it's one of those places where you really feel like you're seeing nature as previous generations saw it. And in Big Bend, you really are. A friend of mine's got a ranch out there where he has preserved a lot of the prehistoric features of the ranch. They've been preserved since that place was settled. So you can go to places in Big Bend and you can see uh, what it what it was like when the uh, prehistoric Indians were there. I mean, they left their fire middens and their burned rocks and their trash piles and you can see all that um it's a really neat place but it's also on the mexican border and borderlands come with their own set of issues and as we sit here in 2022 we realize those issues never really go away and that was certainly true in the early 1900s so let's go back there and get wise about texas Back in the 1920s, the Big Bend was even more remote than it is now. And the Johnson Ranch was a remote place within a remote place. Elmo and Ada Johnson established a ranch and trading post in 1927. So let's stop right there and think about the border, the Texas-Mexican border, about 1927. The Mexican Revolutionary Period is generally considered to be about from 1910 to 1917. And during that time, all up and down the border, revolutionary activity would spill over into the United States. And of course, the biggest part of that into Texas. You had revolutionaries hiding in the United States. You had revolutionaries seeking U.S. cooperation. You had revolutionaries raiding into the United States to steal steal supplies. You had revolutionaries uh, raiding into the United States or coming into the United States to recruit fighters. Uh, You had uh, the famous, of course, Pancho Villa raid into Columbus, New Mexico, killing uh, many of its citizens. The border in those days uh, was not all that different from when it was first settled, that is, uh, wide open spaces. So you had 
uh, very relatively few settlers to the scope of the landscape. And so it was easy to um, disappear. It was easy to operate. Uh, the Rio Grande River didn't signify much except water you needed to cross uh, in the course of your duties. There was no military to speak of down there. There was some, um, but relative to the size of the area, uh, there was no border patrol relative to the size of the area. So you were on a frontier, really. And um, anytime you have a frontier, you often have a certain degree of lawlessness and the ability, uh, the ability to disappear being an important feature of that. So think about, compare that to, uh, let's say, the um, Spanish border with Louisiana in the 1700s, 1800s, where you had the neutral ground after the Louisiana Purchase. There was a negotiation uh, between the United States and Spain and later, later Mexico about the neutral ground. Well, what happened in the neutral ground? That was the area around the Sabine and Neches Rivers in Far East Texas and Western Louisiana. What happened in that ground? Well, people flocked there because there was no, it was a no man's land, literally, and there were no, there was no law enforcement. So uh, it was an easy place to disappear. And you had people, um, I don't want to digress too much, but you had uh, Mexican, Spanish and Mexican officials traveling to East Texas reporting back that uh, there's a huge number of Americans here. That Of course, they had no idea they were there because uh, precisely because it was a sparsely pro- populated frontier. So you have a similar situation, uh, not, quite, not quite as sparse, but similar situation dictated largely by the landscape down – um, on the southern border, and particularly in this far west Texas uh, Big Bend area. Now, having said that, I will say that a uh, somewhat sparsely populated uh, large landscape where you're free to kind of do whatever you want to do is very, very attractive to people. Uh, that's how communities like Terlingwood developed. And um, that that's, uh, holds some attraction, but you've got to have some order. Uh, the United States doesn't function without order. And so that uh, creates some tension. Well, in addition to the revolutionaries coming across the border during that time period, you also had uh, raids across the Rio Grande from uh, nefarious characters who wanted to, to steal. Now, these weren't necessarily... The word bandit is used to capture... Uh, has been used to capture a lot any incursion from Mexico into the United States. And, and we can use the word bandit, um, but not all bandits were created equal. But you did, have, you did have the risk of people crossing from Mexico into the United States to uh, depredate in some fashion, uh, which naturally would give rise to a focus of law enforcement activities uh, on this border. And you had the... Uh, the Texas Rangers coming down there to uh, enforce the law. Now, you got to remember, during the early 1900s, again, dictated by the landscape, because of the landscape, what what is the difference? Ask yourself, what is the difference between, um, let's say, a military, a group of militant revolutionaries coming in as an army, crossing the border into the United States for whatever purpose, and the response the army would make to that. What's the difference between armed men on horseback who may simply want to steal cattle? What's the proper response to that? Well, law enforcement, not the military, would be in charge of that response, but the response would effectively be the same. You're still doing military battle, uh, probably on horseback. And so there's really no difference between military action and law enforcement action. Now, why do I mention that on this podcast? Because I want you to start thinking about that. The Bicentennial of the Rangers is coming up next year. We're going to do a lot of episodes on the Rangers. We're going to do a lot on the Mexican border. So think about the concept of how you enforce the law in this area. And is it really any different than a military operation? So so you've got a pretty remote and wild place and uh, dangerous place down on this border. So a husband and wife, Elmo and Ada Johnson, setting up in this area was a risk. They were 150 miles south of Alpine, uh, which means basically out of reach. The nearest town of any kind was a town called Castellon, about 16 miles up the Rio Grande. Um, They were in the middle of nowhere, (laughs) to put it simply. Um, But Elmo Johnson 
said that he never worried because he kept the peace in his own way. He was a crack shot. He told an interviewer, he was interviewed interviewed in the uh, 60s. He said, I quote, I kept the peace. We never had as much as a watermelon stolen, close quote. Um, there's another great story about Mr. Johnson. Uh, one day he saw a guy that he thought was on the run from the law. And so he got in his car, and this is the 20s, he got in his car and chased him until the car wouldn't go any further. You know, if you've driven around Big Ben, there are places that you got to have certain kind of vehicles. So the, the guy who was running got off his horse and started running on foot, um, running away from, from Elmo Johnson. So Johnson just gave up the chase. And it turns out this guy went into the sheriff in Alpine, and he filed charges against Johnson saying Johnson had been shooting at him. So the sheriff and a deputy and a couple of Texas Rangers go down to Johnson's trading post. They make now Johnson wasn't there at the time, but they, these guys uh, figure out or were guided to where this incident allegedly occurred. And uh, as soon as Johnson heard about what had happened, he went up to Alpine himself. And uh, he said, yeah, I chased the guy, but I hadn't shot at him. Uh, and I certainly hadn't shot at him three times. Apparently, the guy had claimed he'd been shot at three times. And one of the rangers said, uh, and this is uh, supposedly a quote, quote, Elmo, I told him it was a damn lie. You wouldn't have shot but once anyway, close quote. So no charges were uh, filed on Elmo Johnson. But that was kind of a day in the life um, down at Johnson's ranch. Well, let's fast forward to 1929. Um, Herbert Hoover was set to be inaugurated president in March of 1929, and a man in Mexico, General Don Jose Gonzalez Escobar, had planned a rebellion to coincide with that inauguration, and the hope was that if he started that rebellion and was quickly successful, that the new American president would recognize his government. So he starts the the revolution, uh, fights over a few weeks, and it didn't work out for, for Escobar. Well, uh, in April, 30 or 40 of Escobar's former cavalry appeared on the banks of the Rio Grande across from the Johnson Ranch and set up camp. Now, obviously, this got Johnson's attention. What Johnson didn't know was these men had deserted Escobar. There was a battle um, that was very devastating for the rebels, and uh, they had deserted Escobar, and the federal government of Mexico, of course, was looking for them. So... Uh, the Johnsons were in a little bit of a dangerous spot. On April 11th, uh, this is 1929, three riders crossed the river and appeared at Johnson's trading post asking for food. Well, Johnson gave them some corn and gave them some beans, and he said, look, if you'll wait until my um, goat herder comes back, I'll give you a goat also. Um, So Elmo and Ada watched that rebel camp until darkness and then they went to bed in the middle of the night johnson woke up hearing hoofbeats on the ground two men from the camp appeared at his house asking to buy tobacco so johnson sent them down to where the store was and uh, johnson went in the store through the back door let them in sold them some tobacco and they paid um they rolled some cigarettes lit them up and uh kept johnson in the store Uh, Johnson noticed they were growing increasingly nervous, so he turned to pick up a rifle that he kept behind the counter. At that point, the men ran out the front door. Johnson chased them out the door, and as he did, he looked over and saw that his cattle and his goats were being driven by another group of the rebels across the river uh, or toward the river, toward Mexico. So he fired at the thieves. The thieves abandoned the animals that they were trying to steal and and uh, hoofed it across the river. So Johnson reported this raid to the Army stationed at what was then Camp Marfa, and the Army sent troops down to begin a patrol of the area and to patrol down the river. The Army did that. They patrolled around. They didn't find um, any further sign of uh, anybody coming across the border, but what it did was raise the alarm. Now, that... um, extended discussion I had earlier about Mexican bandits, either thieves or raiders or what have you, coming across the river, that time period had kind of ended. 
And so with this Escobar rebellion, what the fear in this incident at Johnson's Ranch, what the fear was, was that this situation uh, was going to start up again and there'd be a whole nother round of border violence. Now, another issue I want to mention is that the Hispanic population on the U.S. side of the border was firmly in uh, what could be described as the American camp. Uh, people live together. The, the city, whether you were a citizen or not was not nearly uh, the issue back then that it is today. And people crossed over the border at will. Um, in fact, that really continued even into my lifetime. But it didn't really matter whether you were American or Mexican, whether you were white or Hispanic. The good guys were being threatened by the bad guys. That was, that was uh, how it broke down there. So that's important to keep in mind, uh, especially these days. Something new was going on with the uh, U.S. Army as well. In 1910, the first military airplane flight took place, took place in San Antonio. Now, we're several years now, uh, at the time of the Johnson's Ranch incident in the 20s, we're several years after World War I, and Army aviation is up and running. And the Army was planning on putting an air base somewhere on our southern border. And the, the whole Johnson Ranch incident gave the government an idea. There was a reporter in West Texas named W.D. Smithers. Smithers had come to the border in 1916 and fell in love with it and spent the rest of his career uh, as a reporter chronicling uh, the area and also taking photographs. There's actually a collection of his photographs that the uh, Texas State Historical Association published. Um, so Smithers did a story on the Johnson Ranch raid, and he asked Johnson uh, about maybe putting an Army air base on his land, uh, which Johnson thought was a great idea. I mean, it took, you think about soldiers traveling, uh, just as I described from Marfa, down to that area. It would have taken days. In fact, did take days. And so... If you're trying, even uh, even if you're cavalry uh, with mules and horses, uh, it would take days to get anywhere. So there was no such thing as emergency response, and the terrain is so difficult um, on extraordinarily difficult on horses and difficult enough on mules. Um, then you got logistics and supply and all of that. So Johnson thought, yeah, this is a great idea. So after Smithers talked to him, Smithers went to uh, an Army officer, and he said, hey, I've got an idea. How about an airfield at this at Johnson's Ranch? Uh, and the Army liked the idea. Um, so the Army began evaluating whether Johnson's Ranch would be a suitable site. And the, the officer in charge of this project was a lieutenant named Thad Foster. Um, now, I, I do want to mention that the—, the there were planes on the border. These were not going to be the first. This was not going to be the first airport on the border. There were some planes at Marfa. Um, Foster had already done a little bit of scouting up and down the border. They were looking for a place for an airfield, but he hadn't known about Johnson's Ranch. Now, let me tell you about Thad Foster. He was a character, as many great pilots are. Uh, one Army colonel described Lieutenant Foster this way, quote, he just loved to fly. He spent his life in an airplane, close quote. Um, aviation was somewhat new, of course, so Foster achieved some notoriety, which allowed him a considerable amount of independence uh, as an Army officer. He would later become close friends with Elmo Johnson and was the uh, most frequent visitor to Johnson's ranch. By the way, I'll mention here the, John the field register um, the log of, of the uh, arrivals and departures at, at this airfield survives. It's in the archives at Sol Ross University. So um, also present, by the way, I might mention Lieutenant Foster. Uh, there were some female names in that register accompanying Lieutenant Foster on those flights, uh, a lot of them, as a matter of fact. And you talk about a character. He wasn't afraid uh, to mention who he would fly around with on these supposedly official military flights. Um, and they certainly weren't all the same names either. Uh, every time he did that, he risked a court-martial. Um, another account, there was another story I read about Foster that said uh, one day he was he was striding out to his airplane carrying his parachute, uh, which indicated he was going on a longer flight. And uh, 
he hadn't filed a flight plan, flight plan so the um, guy in charge of the field runs out after him and asks him where he was going, and he turns around, sneered at him, said, don't you worry about me, and uh, took off. So they had no idea where he was going, how long he was supposed to be going, when he was supposed to be back or anything. Uh, so suffice to say, Thad Foster went his own way. Um, so they reviewed uh, on the map – the location and and uh, Foster heard from Smithers and others about the terrain at Johnson's Ranch, so it sounded like a good place. Um, and uh, you might imagine that he had a lot in common with Elmo Johnson. It's no surprise they later became friends. I mean, these are guys who had to do it their own way. Foster, because he was an early aviator, and Johnson because of where he lived and the conditions that he lived under. Um, well, uh, Foster decided that Johnson's Ranch would be a good place. Now, why did he do that? Well, first of all, he's fl- it was flat. Um, the Big Bend area has a lot of mountainous areas, uh, but Johnson had a large area of flat land that would allow for easier approaches. One thing uh, to remember about these early days of aviation is you didn't often fly at night. Uh, this was way, way before any modern electronic navigational aids, no air traffic control, no runway lights. There was nothing like that. So a large flat area was pretty attractive. Um, Now, Johnson's Ranch being so remote, if you were a pilot and you were headed out there, you wanted it to be as safe as possible because you were on your own. Uh, There wasn't wasn't anything to help you out there. Um, The Army would not need to do a lot of clearing. Uh, or to create an area or to build flat areas or anything like that. Um, now, they weren't contemplating building concrete runways uh, at all, but they wouldn't have to do any meaningful prep prep work um, on the dirt. Uh, I've landed. I landed actually in a fairly sizable aircraft on a ranch strip on a Big Bend ranch. It can be an adventure, I can tell you. Um, in fact, on the flight that I'm talking about, the we buzzed the strip and the pilot said, yeah, it's probably fine. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what we're dealing with uh, out there. So we made it, by the way. Um, So they started to clear a place to land a plane so they could have a first flight out there. So they moved all the large rocks from what would eventually become the first runway. So you just picked an area out there and said, all right, we're going to just clear all the large rocks from this area. They took some lime and they put a big N for north on the north side of the field to mark it. Um, They removed a strip of greasewood. Greasewood is a small, woody, shrubby-looking plant. Um, They they took a strip of that greasewood out. So now you could see um, what would look like to a pilot a runway. Um, and it would give you the visual effect of the landing strip, but it would also, you know, the actual effect, uh, creating a little safer place to come down. Now, in the last few sentences, I've used three different words, runway, field, and strip. Okay. So you got to, you can make a strip in a field, uh, but a runway, you got to build. This was a field. They were clearing a field. Uh, the removal of the greasewood gave it the impression of a strip, but you were still landing in a field. That's basically what Lieutenant Thad Foster faced on April 24th when he made the first flight into this uh, hopefully new Army airfield. Um, Elmo Johnson, they had some uh, yellow smoke devices, which they lit, hoping that Foster would more easily see the place. Uh, Foster came in, he made it, he landed safely. He informed them that it was the tin roof of Johnson's house that he had seen first before he ever saw any of that smoke. And once he landed, he got out, looked around, proclaimed it ready for service. Um, And so it became, the process was initiated to have it officially designated as an Army airfield. Not too terribly long after that, uh, the Army did something interesting. They flew two transport aircraft down there from San Antonio. And in those aircraft were uh, soldiers and all their equipment. So, uh, and that was successful too. So all of a sudden you had a platoon of soldiers coming from San Antonio to this remote area of the state in about four hours. It would have taken that same platoon four days to get there under other circumstances. 
So it's unclear uh, who knew what or who had the vision, but this was a very important moment for the United States Army. By July 1929, uh, the official authorization came designating Johnson's Ranch as an Army airfield. Uh, Thad Foster, of course, flew down there to deliver it. A, uh, a crowd of six people assembled to dedicate the field. Um, and Foster signed the official field register for Johnson's Ranch as the first uh, Army arrival. By the way, that uh, that uh, field register is interesting because if you look at it and look at the planes that landed, you will see the evolution of Army aviation during this time period as the planes changed. Um, let me mention the plane that Thad Foster flew down there, though. It was a de Havilland DH-4. De Havilland is an English company, and they made the airframe. It had a Liberty 12-cylinder engine, and that was made it by United States uh, company. It had two seats. Pilot was in front. Uh, the gunner observer was in the back. It was a biplane, fabric covered wings. Uh, the nose of the aircraft is flat. And so uh, there'll be pictures on the website and social media after this episode, but you'll recognize this plane. You've seen pictures of it. And uh, it was flat because that was a radiator uh, right behind the propeller to cool the engine and made it a, gave it a very distinctive look. Another thing that was funny about this plane is it carried a spare tire under the fuselage, just tied up there like you had at the last minute decided you wanted to carry a tire with you. But the problem was that the landing gear of this plane was designed in such a way uh, that there was a crossbar uh, between the wheels that was only 12 inches off the ground. So that was your ground clearance. Now, that's fine if you're landing on a concrete runway. That's fine if you're landing, you know, just almost anywhere except Big Bend. It was not fine. When you landed, you better have the tail of that aircraft all the way down. Um, and the way you would do that is is give it a little power, get that propeller blast blowing a little harder uh, over the elevators in the back of the plane and keep that tail on the ground. Um, or that meager 12 inches of ground clearance uh, would result in catching the aircraft and you go and nose down, which meant uh, best case, new propeller, uh, worst case, something catastrophic. So every landing in that aircraft, especially at Big Ben, was an adventure. Another interesting feature of that airplane is that the pilot sat right behind the propeller and right behind the exhaust pipes, which were short. Uh, so as you flew the aircraft, you were slowly going deaf from the engine roar and uh, breathing a constant stream of engine exhaust. So this was truly the Wild West. Well, let's talk about the airfield. So one interesting aspect of the airfield was that Elmo Johnson himself was in charge of it. The government was leasing it from him for a dollar a year, uh, but Johnson was on his own. So even though he had this army airfield, he was still uh, the, you know, he and Ada were the only two people on this ranch, now army airfield, uh, in same place on the border, etc. So what Johnson did is he went out and he piled some rocks up. He made two piles a hundred feet apart and, and on the west end of where these planes would land and thereby created kind of an indication of where this strip, such as it was, uh, was and kind of gave the pilots a guide to when they were coming in. Now think about that for a minute. If you've uh, flown, been looking out the window, flying in uh, to a commercial airport any time in the last 50 years, you see all kinds of lights and arrows and all different colors and et cetera. Well, if you were flying into Johnson's Ranch, you would see two piles of rocks. And uh, you could only see those, of course, through your goggles um, when you got low enough and close enough. His house, Elmo Johnson's house, was the was the overnight accommodation for anybody arriving at Johnson's airfield. Uh, his trading post, of course, was the commissary and FBO or wh uh, whatever you want to call it uh, of this private military base. There really was no, there certainly was nothing like it before, and there really hadn't been anything like it that I know of since. Um, eventually, the field was expanded. The Army brought a grader down for Johnson to use, left it with him so he could use it to maintain the field. Now, at the same time, the, the technology, the military uh, aviation technology was expanding 
uh, fairly rapidly, but Johnson's Ranch represented the furthest uh, extension of any of that technology uh, into the most remote sections uh, of the United States. Well, when a military base is opened in an area, it, it definitely affects the um, the rest of the area. Johnson's Ranch was no different. Um, the Army aviators were encouraged to get out and fly as much as they could. And, of course, Johnson's Ranch was a popular destination. One thing that I, I don't think I've mentioned so far is the recreational opportunities were nice. When you're, you know, we go to Big Bend now as tourists uh, to have fun. Well, that was all available then. Uh, one of the things that they could do on Johnson's, the pilots could do on Johnson's Ranch was hunt or target shoot, which they, most of them love to do. So it was, um, you know, if the Army said, well, go out and fly, why wouldn't you go down there and go on a little hunting trip? Another thing that uh, some of the pilots did was they'd come there on the weekends and some of the, um, there was something called the Army Aviation School of Medicine, and they would set up these weekend clinics. They'd come in there and, and give uh, free medical care to uh, anybody that showed up there, which i um, not sure what the medical ethics of that were, but of course the, it was very popular. Um, rumor has it that civilians would be able to get a ride in a military aircraft, perhaps, if uh, they appeared at Johnson's Ranch on a Sunday afternoon. Also, uh, for sure, against uh, Army policy, but you can imagine uh, many of the people out there had never seen an airplane, uh, much less to ride in one would be a fascinating experience over Big Ben. At one point, there was a double murder committed in the area, and uh, the lawmen converged on Johnson's Ranch, and uh, again, it appears that uh, Army aviation was used in pursuit of uh, the fugitives, and uh, successfully, by the way, and may or may not have extended into the nation of Mexico, which of course is uh, an egregious violation of all kinds of laws, both domestic and international um, but nevertheless, uh, who was going to blow the whistle so far out in the Big Ben? Well, eventually, the uh, Army Air Corps modernized uh, the plane. There were a wide variety of planes uh, that landed at Johnson's Ranch as technology evolved. Um, Johnson's The field was expanded. And uh, the one interesting thing, one of the greatest aircraft uh, in the U.S. military was the B-17, and it made its debut while Johnson's Ranch was still active. There aren't any, there's no evidence that a B-17 landed there, but it's uh, interesting to think about and wonder uh, what would have happened. They certainly could have. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, the need for Johnson's Ranch uh, as an airfield uh, declined, and finally, on April 1st, 1942, the state of Texas purchased Johnson's Ranch, and it was included and remains a part of Big Bend National Park. Even after the purchase, uh, the civilian air patrol would land there from time to time, and the final field entry is dated November 25th, 1943, ending a tremendous era in the advent of military aviation and a very interesting time on the tumultuous land that is the Texas-Mexican border. Now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places that um, I mentioned in the episode. We'll start, obviously, with Johnson's Ranch. Now, this is going to be a little bit difficult to describe. It's in the park. Um, as I said in the episode, it's 16 miles down the river from Castellone. You're going to need to pull up a park map. There's something that the National Park Service calls a brochure map. And if you locate the Castellon store, which is open uh, year round, there's also a visitor center there closed in the summer. But um, it's uh, Johnson's Ranch is tw about 27 miles or marked 27 miles down River Road West, down river from Castellon, 27 miles on River Road West. Now, um, I have not been there. And so I can't tell you, you might need a high clearance vehicle to get there. Uh, Many of the listeners uh, shoot me an email, host at wiseabouttexas.com or tweet or Instagram at wiseabouttexas. Put on there your experience if you've been by Johnson's Ranch or what River Road West is like. And uh, if you go there, if you're listening to this podcast and you do go to Johnson's Ranch, be sure and send your pictures to host at wiseabouttexas.com. I'd love to see them. Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio has a museum. Uh, that museum is located at 1405 East Grayson Streets, Building 16, 
in Fort Sam Houston. Put that address in uh, in San Antonio. It'll take you to the museum. That's where Army Aviation started. And I'm just going to send you to Marfa, um, where the cavalry camp was back in the day. Marfa is always fun to visit if you're uh, out there in the Big Bend region. I like to go out 90 from Del Rio and go that way, but uh, Marfa's out there west. You'll find uh, lots of great stuff in town, lots of great art, lots of great food. Uh, so make sure you factor that into your trip. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Thank you for loving Texas as much as I do. Go find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. Like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you get a minute, that helps people find the show. If you want to help preserve and promote Texas history, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, patreon.com slash wise about Texas and support the show. Thanks again for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.